go ahead and get started now. Um, hi, welcome everyone. We're so happy that you're here with us um, today for this really important conversation. Um, my name is Lindsay Stanick and I'm the new Communications and Development Manager at American Friends of Combatants for Peace. We're so excited to welcome you to this incredible event today with former Speaker of the Knesset, Avram Berg. Um, this talk will be moderated by Becca Strober. She's the Senior Manager at Breaking the Silence. If you have any questions for the speakers throughout the talk, um, please send them directly to the chat box where it says send questions here in all caps. Um, this is our first talk in our series, Resisting the Radical Right. And if you enjoy this talk and want to participate in others, you should be able to see um, the link to register in the chat box. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Becca now. Um, thanks so much. Great, thanks so much for having me and having us. Um, I'll just quickly say two words uh, about breaking the silence. We are an organization of former soldiers who served in the occupied territories, so West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. Um, and today we have over 1,300 testifiers who've got, come given testimony and talked about their time serving in these areas in order to have a genuine conversation about um, what is the price of controlling another people over time. Um, and we have two major things that we do in our organization, if you don't know, if you don't know it yet. The first is that we collect testimonies from former soldiers. And the second is we use those testimonies as a base for our educational work. We give tours in two main places, Hebron, uh, which is a city, and the South Hebron Hills, which is a rural area. Um, and we are an organization who has been around since 2004, who's fighting to end the occupation. Of course, we don't believe we can do it alone, um, but we think that it is incredibly urgent and important that there is a conversation that's happening on the basis of what the reality actually looks like on the ground. And with that being said, uh, I'd like to welcome Avram Borg, our speaker tonight. Um, Avram is a former uh, head of the Knesset, also served in the Knesset, uh, speaker of the Knesset, uh, also served in the Knesset before that. Um, Avram, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm assuming you're joining us from Jerusalem, but it's a guess. No, it's a wrong one. Try another one. Uh, I'm, living in a small, I'm living in a small village which is called Nataf, which is somewhere uh, off the road between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv on the top of the hill. So I'm a kind of an Israeli hillbilly. So I'm in my home at Nataf. Perfect. Nataf is quite beautiful. Um, so just to kind of get us started, and I'll, um, I'll just say again that we're going to be taking questions throughout this talk tonight. It's going to be a conversation based on your questions. So you can immediately start sending the questions that you have to the send questions here um, option in the chat. Um, but Avram, well, just to kind of get us started, I mean, obviously a lot's gone on in the past few months in terms of Israeli politics. Tonight's, um, you know, big topic is resisting the uh, extreme right or resisting the radical right. Um, you've been in politics for a long time. I'm on the ground on a pretty much daily basis in the West Bank. I'm sure we both agree that the situation, you know, it's not that yesterday it was good or two months ago it was good and, you know, now everything's gone downhill. And with that being said, what do you think is the main kind of difference um, that you've noticed thus far or that you think inherently exists between everything we've seen in governments up until this moment and the government that's just come uh, into being. Hi, good afternoon, evening here, midday, wherever you are, or good day. Um, it's a good question, which I'm not at all sure my answer is as qualitative as the question. Take it, all of us are reading papers and whatever paper you read, will it be Haaretz in Hebrew and English? Will it be New York Times? Will it be whatever it is? It's a very confusing moment. I mean, each and every one of us ask him or herself every morning and you, is that possible? Does that really happen? So the first blunt answer is, oh yes, it does happen. And this is a very beautiful moment in a sense. It's the moment of my mom. 
I mean, like my mom, I can tell you, I told you, maybe not you personally and not necessarily you people, but we people told other people, hey, pay attention. It goes this way. I mean, you begin with moderate settlements and you end up with mounting the Temple Mount. You begin with making a distinction between Jewish terrorists and Palestinian terrorists, and you end up with Jewish supremacy. You begin with turning your eye away from, from so many red lines that we promised ourselves so many years ago and during the years we should never cross. And now we look back and we say, wow, we crossed many of them. But each and every one was tiny, was little, was thin, was insignificant. And altogether, we crossed them all, and here we are. So it's a moment of, wow, what, either wake up or we told you. So let's, instead of describing what is written on the papers that each and every one of us can read and understand, and try to grasp the insight, if there is an insight, uh, uh, for some of them. Organizations like Breaking the Silence, B'Tselem, Combatant for Peace, these kind of organizations, organizations that for me as an outsider, I mean, I participate in the activities, I try to help as much as I can, but I'm not on the ground, as Becca said earlier, are organizations which try to do or assume to do Something which is fascinating, instead of going against the notion of Israel, it, they come and say, though they do not always articulate it this way, listen, Israel, if you are really serious about the standards that you define yourself, the only democracy in the Middle East, law and order, Jewish in the classical way and democratic, we would like to help you to climb up to the level of the standards you set. But it's impossible to have a political reality in which you have such high pompous rhetorics and such low embarrassing reality. So organizations like Combatant for Peace or Breaking the Silence and few other civil society organizations are those who try to build the bridge between the norm and the reality. So in a very, very basic way, they are very pro-Israel organizations, unlike the way the adversaries, the political adversaries of us and these organizations try to say, you are traitors, you are Trojan horses, you are well poisoners, you are stabbing the back of the nation, or you're just friends of Avram Burg. I mean, very positive and constructive organizations via seeking the truth. Not easy nowadays because the kind of an attack that we see or the kind of the new government policy is not anymore a tiny, little, minor, marginal, insignificant change here or there. There is now a very, very uh, powerful hand wrestling over what will be the operating system of Israel. Will the operating system of Israel will be democratic one, regardless of what is democratic, but it has an ingredient of equality into it, ingredient of fairness and ingredient of justice? Or will it be something else based on the notion of the Jewish people are chosen and therefore the Jewish element in Israel is supreme and we talk about Israel with a, with a Jewish supremacy. So it's a struggle between democracy for all equal and just and fair or Jewish for some in a very selective Judge, judgmental way. The next element is not only it is all out struggle about the operating system, it has two other elements that we have to keep in mind before we open any discussion. The first is the working assumption that the minute we have any kind of a threat, be it external, be it whatever, it's automatically the entire Jewish collective gets together. 
And we are all there for each other. We are all brothers, we are all sisters, solidarity, fraternity, togetherness. Give me the words. Give me, give me all of these beautiful, uh, uh, oily, rosy words. And I say, no, 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 I'm not at all sure. Because yes, evidently so, there are racist Jews of the worst kind of racism we experience and other did. And there are some unbelievable, beautiful, fantastic, peace lover Palestinians. So all of a sudden, it is not the genetic or religious or ethnical or tribal collection of one group versus the other, but it is some of us and some of them versus some of the Jews and some of the others, which are not members with the same value system group. So it's us who believe in democracy, in human equality, in fairness, and in peace versus some Jews and Palestinians and others who do not and resist it, be them Hamas or be it Bengvir. Last but not least, it is a struggle of the Israelis. I do not believe, never believed in those ex machina that one day the Redeemer riding a white horse will come from the White House or from Germany or from the European Union and redeem Israel from itself. No, it's the struggle of us Israelis because Israel belongs to its Israelis. But the role, but the role of so many of us But the role of so many of us who, um, um, I'm sorry, I had a glitch here, a second, yeah. The role of so many of us outside of Israel who believe that whatever happens here has an impact over other circles of life, be it world jury, be it liberals, democratic peace lover all over the world, and the risk of our conflict to deteriorate from a national political conflict to a religious all around comprehensive world conflict is something that should trouble many humans around the world. So there are many things to be done outside of Israel for the sake of the stability and the peace of the world to be done by you that eventually in conjunction with our protest and struggle and believe in the possibility to change the situation that all together can create a critical mass that will change the current state of affairs. So back up for your question, it is more of the same on one sense because it's the same players and the same people yet now it's now it's money time. It's to the extreme. It's all of them versus all of us, and we must win. I want to um, just kind of give a small example to kind of talk about what you're saying from the field, from from how I've seen it over the past years. Because you know, I've been going to Hebron for the past um, many years, probably eight or nine years, um, and I know your family's from there. And for the past five years, I've been giving tours with Breaking the Silence, and a lot of those tours are to young Israelis, to 18-year-olds in pre-military academies, right? Um, which, for people who don't know, a pre-military academy is kind of like a gap year, but in, instead of it being between high school and college, it's between high school and the military. And, you know, you get to this point in Hebron, which is the largest Palestinian city in the West Bank, not including East Jerusalem, and, and the center of the city um, is is basically what in the army they they call we call sterile meaning palestinians can't walk there and you know you you stand in this valley um avram knows this i'm sure you've been there many times but for the audience you stand in this valley and you see you know palestinian buildings above the the israeli settlement and five years ago you know we would get to that point and you talked about red lines just little by little we cross these red lines and i agree with you because Five years ago, I would ask 18 year olds, you know, what's our agreed upon red line? You know, what's the lowest common denominator that we have? And five years ago, more or less, our common denominator was we won't kick these Palestinians out of their homes, right? We won't transfer them out in order to make sure that the Israeli settlement is safe. Um, that's no longer an agreed upon uh, red line today. 
with 18 year olds in pre-military academies. I mean, I'm obviously I can't generalize and say no one agrees with that, but you have today a fair amount of these youth who are saying, no, it's totally fine to transfer them out, right? And then the next green, the next red line we agree on is that we won't physically harm people, right? And so we're constantly seeing it um, go down. Um, and so I think you're right that this really is a money time and it's a money time both in terms of what people can do abroad and also really where we are at as, an, as a society. Um, someone asked, um, Avram, can you comment on, oh, now I just lost it. Okay. Um, can you comment on Secretary Blink, uh, Blinken's visit and specifically his words, the recognition that building consensus for new proposals is the most effective way to ensure they're embraced and they endure? I don't really know. I mean, I read it in the paper the same way everybody else did. And what does that mean? Is that the unhappiness of the administration from the current government? Is that a kind of a gentle American rebuke? Is that a hint? All of the above. Yes, it is, but it is so American. My father used to say about Arik Sharon that he has an elephant skin and everybody can see it. We Israelis, we have elephant skin. I mean, Secretary Blinken, do you really think that anybody listens to this kind of nuanced, beautifully articulated reservation that you have from the current political process in Israel? Come on. Come on. Nobody do. Nobody does. Doesn't work this way. I mean, the elephant skin has also elephant ears, which are quite, were not cleaned recently for this kind of beautifully uh, uh, poetry. If you ask me now, what can be done? I mean, from the American point of view, Tom Friedman is right that Biden is maybe the last American president who really cares about Israel, the, the, the good old way. If there is one achievement that Netanyahu achieved, infamous achievement during his term is actually to polarize the topic of Israel in American politics. From being a bipartisan consensus, it became very partisan, very political, and to the extreme right of the conservative fundamentalist Tea Party uh, uh, philosophy. This is for my grandchildren, okay? Who think that they have an alternative conference here. Um, so the question is not necessarily how to move Biden to bring Israel back to the Golda Meir days because he met Golda Meir. Did you hear that? Did you know that he met Golda Meir? I had this anecdote 20,000 times. Golda Meir is not here anymore. And I didn't know, but I would agree that it's a bit of an outdated it so example. so many times, and he believes Israel is still at the 70s of the time of Golda Meir. Come on, President Biden, Biden, wake up. And I believe that the only way to go about it is a serious deliberation. I mean, I, 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 I will outline a process rather than a poem. Imagine that at the Democratic Convention next year, I think it's early 2024, there is a resolution to be discussed that no American weapon or information or pieces of intelligence can be used by any hatred regime around the world, be it occupying Israel or be it Myanmar, be it India or be it I don't know whom. If your regime is, or your government is responsible for deprivation of people from their democratic rights, negating the human and the civil basic birthrights of people, you cannot use American technology, period. It's not against Israel. It's simply the American way of life. That's the value system, that's the value system uh, um, we speak so much about the shared values between Israel and America. Occupying the Palestinians, compromising democracy might be, might be 
Trump and Tea Party and 20 opposition at the Republican Party value system and Netanyahu and Ben Gvir. But it is not necessarily the democratic value system. It does not even correspond with the American, with the American anthem about the lands of the free and the home of the brave. And um, if a resolution like this of freedom and bravery will be passed and will be discussed at the Democratic Party, the Israeli decision makers will understand that the days of occupation and the days of illiberal democracy should be numbered because otherwise we're going to lose the big brother, big sister United States of America. You know, First of all, I, I totally I, I agree. And I think, you know, to add to what you're saying that I think is interesting, there's a lot of ways to look on how and why the U.S. has founded. But of course, one of them is um, the fact that the U.S., um, you know, the original Bill of Rights was rights against an occupying government, right? It was rights against England. And if you look in the occupied territories today, the West Bank, but not exclusively, every single right that... Um, Americans see as inherent do not exist in the occupied territories. Um, and so it really should be a foundation um, that we're seeing in the politics of our big brother, right? Um, and with, with that being said, I, I want to move on um, to a question that's on people's mind, um, which is how do you see the events of the past, you know, the very violent events in Janine and Jerusalem that have happened over um, the past week? You know, how do you see this as playing into the bigger political question that's happening right now? And of course, the reaction of the new government or reaction or initiative of the new government um, and, 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 and its potential effect on the situation. It has a lot to do with the limitation of power. This government reacts in Janine and in wherever he does no really different than the previous governments of Israel. And Israel is in many ways vis-a-vis -vis the occupied territories. You don't really, we hardly ever had a peace, government of peace. We have 50 shades of right-wing governments. Okay, so by the end of the entire hulala, of the new government and full right and totally right and absolute right and we are now uh, ruling etc the only thing they know is how to block the door of a, of a, of a, of a 20 of a 13 years old boy come on that's not a new policy so on one hand it's the limitation of the power because the right wing rhetorics meets the real reality and already less than a month into position, already disappointing their own constituency. And uh, it's a beginning of a wakening up on one hand. On the other hand, it's a demonstration of a very, very sad demonstration of maybe the most, I will not say criminal, but I'll say irresponsible policies of Israel of the last 30 years or so. Abu Mazen was, now he's very, very weak, but he was the real representative of the Palestinian peace camp. He was a real partner to cut a deal with Israel. But Israel of the right either did not want or didn't have the courage to make a deal with him over the issue of a Palestinian state in the occupied territories of, of, of the West Bank because they were afraid, terrified, or even abducted and kidnapped by the settlers. So we did the utmost to weaken Abu Mazen by negotiating with Hamas at the West Bank, by giving them money, by do whatever possible but talking with the Palestinian Authority. The result is that the Palestinian Authority and its security operations and, 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 and institutions got very, very weak, lost their control over the field, and their own militias, their own uprise, uh, sub, not sub state, but sub authority, local forces taking over, and we don't have a partner to control and to tame them. Whatever we see in Janine and in Nablus and in so many other places is the result of Israel weakening the Palestinian Authority, Israel do not really respecting the needs 
of the Palestinian people on the ground and therefore created on one hand a very, very savage, a very, very wild violence, not at the hands of the semi-state, but at the hands of local militias and a very, very high level of despair. The combination of two, despair and no law and order cannot lead to any good place. Absolutely. Um, another question that we have over here, and I think, you know, it's it, it really is interesting at this moment in terms of what you're talking about with the violence, um, that it, it really does show the limits of power, right? Because um, so much of the attacks we see these days are lone wolves. You can't get credible information about lone wolves. You can't really stop lone wolves with military violence. And we're so good at responding militarily, right? You know, the next day the government comes out and says more people should be carrying weapons. But what, you know, what is that actually going to bring um, in, in the end of the day? It's going to bring more violence. And of course it's going to bring more victims. Um, and someone had a question here, which was hopefully, I imagine a bit of a response to this reality is, can you tell us about the launch of the new joint party you're involved in and your expectations for it? For many years, almost two decades, I'm writing and contemplate about the Israeli political system. And the feeling I have and the, the, the analysis I have is that by the end of the day, the organizing idea or the organizing mechanism of the entire political system of Israel is the national communities, Jewish parties and Arab parties. The there was a one or two parties that had an Arab as a fig leaf. There was one Arab party with a Jew as a fig leaf. But all in all, it, it was Arab parties and Jewish parties. And I think it's a mistake. I think Israel should offer, or Israelis should be offered with another alternative. And this is a party which is seeking an Israel which is indifferent to your belonging and identity. Be a Druze, be a Jew, be a secular, be religious, be Christian, be Muslim, be observant, be whatever you like, be liberal, be, pro be progressive, be conservative. But we agree that all citizens should and are equal in front of the law or the constitution we should have, which is a party which is based on civic constitutional values rather than national community uh, uh, organizations. So for years I write about it and people say it is this, it is this, it's not the right time, it's not the right moment. Every, nothing is right here. So colleagues and myself used the attention in the last year and so, two years, there was a lot of political attention. I mean, we kept the formula of four to one. In a normal democracy, every four years, you have one set of elections. Here, every year, we have four sets of elections, but a formula of four to one, we kept. A bit different, but, and there was a lot of political attention. And we, re we actually founded, raised the money in a crowdfunding and uh, registered, registered the first ever party which is called all of its citizens which means israel belongs to all of its citizens equally with no discrimination and what we are working right now is actually the slow deep marathon like uh, a run to build a party which is equipped to deal with the challenges of the 21st century not to build a party according to the concepts of the middle of the 20th century, which are an echo of the 19th century Poland and Russia political Zionist system, but something else, updated, uh, well-versed, and upgraded vis-a-vis -vis the politics, the mechanism, the machinery, the activists, the profile of people, and the values. So we are going through a very, very deep process, and I hope that if and when we shall have normal elections, not next week or next month like we usually have, but let's say in two years time, we shall be ready to offer many Israelis an alternative that didn't have up until today. And I believe it's a very attractive one. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I'm, I'm wondering, based on um, the reality that we're in today and uh, the party, which I'm assuming he was called as Al-Khaya, all, all of its citizens. No. Um, how do you, so I've, I have a few questions, um, I mean, it, it, that, that come into one based on this, but um, I th think what I hear from what you're discussing, amongst other things, really comes down to a lack of a constitution. I'm wondering how much you think that's related. And on kind of piggybacking on that concept, if you think it's a red herring or if you think it's, a pr you know, par principally one of the issues, um, for the past four weeks, there have been major protests, um, as I'm sure a lot of people who are following have read about in the news. Um, I think the height was not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before when there was about 150,000 people protesting. And one of the main things they're protesting in this new government is the potential of weakening the court systems. And people are calling this the end of democracy. Interestingly enough, you have a lot of other major changes in this new government, such as a uh, Smotrich uh, getting responsibilities over the West Bank, um, the civil administration, and you have Benville being given responsibilities over the police, which are, you know, much larger responsibilities and um, decision making power than anyone before this position had. I'm wondering of all these, and, and that's not getting as much um, attention in Israeli society, right? People people didn't go out on the streets because of Smotrich or necessarily because of Ben Gvir. And so I'm wondering where you're seeing in all of this, in this moment, where's the principal fight? Is it the courts? Is it uh, taking over the civil administration? Is it something else? Um, and what are you hoping kind of to come in and be able to give a response to? I understand the end is equal rights but in terms of the reality we're facing at the moment? I would say that many of the protesters go out to the street in order to defend their own comfort zone, not necessarily with the readiness to go all the way toward changing dramatically the entire operating system. And I'll give you two examples. When you march the streets of Tel Aviv during the demonstration this week, this weekend or last weekend, so one corner is the LGTB corner, chanting their own slogans. The other corner is the corner of those who really want to protect the legal system. And those, the other one is of the high tech, which is actually the economic corner. And one corner is those who say, listen, the mother of all evils is the occupation. But then when you ask the organizers, why don't you let some Arabs to speak? Uh, 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 because, okay. And then when you say, why won't you put the occupation at the center of the thing? Because actually what we see is the policies and the practices of the occupy of the occupied territories trickling in the legitimate Israel and actually the police for the Israeli citizens is what the army for the occupied Palestinians and Ben Gvir believes that he can actually have the same policies etc cetera, etc cetera. they say yes but occupation is not a word that all the people like which means what you see now you see now I will say, um, um, you see now many pixels, not yet one comprehensive picture. Everybody comes for a different reason. By the way, the government, thank God, raised so many, uh, so many uh, issues that everybody can, you have a menu of what you want to oppose. They gave you a very, very rich and generous menu. Nonetheless, the feeling is that we are not yet fused into one cohesive political message. Yes, I think that's very, very accurate. Also from my experience there, um, they've been very interesting protests actually. The What you're saying of people don't want to give up their rights. One of the feelings that I've had walking around the 
protests is that there's almost a lack of rage um, in, in the um, in the kind of feeling and the essence of people walking around, which me means people don't quite, um, they haven't had to give up a lot up until this moment, right? We're talking, we're talking about a very specific group um, in society. And someone asks here, we'll take it to a slightly uh, different place, but of course is relevant on a, on a larger issue and I think is important also for people to understand um, what you are offering now is, um, it seems you didn't think or feel this way when you were a leading politician in Israel. Can you please describe what changed and when? When I entered the political system of Israel as one of the very few young founders of the first ever protest movement against a war during the war, which was the 82-40 war in Lebanon. We were four, three soldiers coming back from the front line and establishing the first ever protest movement of soldiers like that, not post-73 trauma, but during the war itself. I was a very young person with actually two, 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 two flags, both of them coming from the school of thought of my teacher and mentor Isaiah Leibovich. One is I would like to have a, I would like to have a separation between church and state, and the second one is to put an end to the malignant, corrupting occupation. And now what? 45, 50 years later, I still want a separation between church and state, and I still want to put an end to the occupation. So, from an ideological, spiritual point of view, I didn't change a millimeter. The political methodology, which party, what kind of a message and message boxing, etc., messaging, the messaging, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is technical. This is technical, technical, and uh, I would say almost tactical. But the principles are there. What changed is Israel. Israel is more religious, more eschatological, more fundamentalist, more nationalist less democratic, more malicious libertarian on one hand, and very insensitive messianic at the same hand. So what changed? Israel changed. I'm in the same place. I'm a very solid conservative person. And with your conservatism, I think you clearly recognize and no, it's it's actually a good use of the word conservative. I mean, you you've hung on to the same principles uh, throughout your political life, um, and yet I think you are aware um, of the absolute necessary change that has to happen at this moment, right? Meaning there has to be. I don't know if there has to be, but likely there will be some sort of fundamental change in order to push us over the edge to. Uh, a different reality. I'm going to, with that, put two questions together um, that have come into the chat. The first is, are we on the brink of the third intifada? Um, obviously, you don't know the answer, but people are interested. A few people asked it. Um, what's your take on that? And the other one is, we have to win. How do we do that? How do we organize? How do we bring people over to our side? And I'm putting these questions together because I think they're very much together telling the the tension of the moment, the very real violence um, that for some people is uh, making us wonder about how is this violence going to play out in real time on the streets? And on the other hand of a very, very urgent moment to get more people to an understanding that what we actually need here is equality. Third Intifada, it's... Uh... In a way, it's a kind of anachronistic question because you have an ongoing unrest. You don't always see it, but it's always there. I think that Bill Clinton was once asked, how do you campaign? And he said, my life is a permanent campaign. Every hand I shake at the McDonald's is a campaign. Every interview I give is a campaign. 
Everything I do is a permanent campaign. There is a permanent intifada. There is a permanent unrest. Sometimes it erupts. Sometimes it makes it to the headlines. Sometimes it is not. But it is never, never, never tranquil, never peaceful. Not pleasant at all. Not pleasant for those who are sensitive to it from the Israeli Jewish point of view of what the heck are we doing there? And very not pleasant to the occupied Palestinians, even those who already lost hope and gave up on the struggle, but accumulated and are deprived of basic rights and even of basic economic rights. Freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of employment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the question, will it be a full-scale intifada? I don't know. And what will be the nature of it? It will be more and more burning points that every now and then will assemble into one. If you remember the two years ago uh, um, operation in, in Gaza, 21. Yeah, it made something very, very interesting. It was for the first time since 48, since the Palestinian Nakba, that all five components of the Palestinian being or the Palestinian reality assembled into one. Gaza, West Bank, Palestinians with Israeli idea, East Jerusalem and Palestinian in exile, all together assembled in order to resist what was seen by them as the violation of the Holy of Holiest at the Temple Mount Haram Sharif. Now, if this government, especially the coming Ramadan, will continue with its either provocation or commitment, it depends how you look at it, to do at the Temple Mount what shouldn't be done there vis-a-vis -vis the issues of religious tolerance and freedom of worship, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we might see reoccurrence of the same uh, Palestinian global pan coalition, pan Palestinian coalition. Otherwise, a lot of unrest. The second one is what do we have to do in order to win? There is a kind of a political wisdom, which is not that we not that stupid. This wisdom that is usually not about the opposition to win as much as it is for the government to lose. And politics, like every politics, has a kind of a pendulum, a pendulum movement. It goes this way and it comes back that way. And sometimes it's our turn, sometimes it's their turn. Okay, that's right. It's also right that the kind of reforms and structural uh, uh, structural rebuilds that Netanyahu cabinet tries to do now in various fields of the Israeli reality be it the independence of the judiciary system, the quality and the openness of the educational system and, and the tolerance toward not exactly like me people, be them secular, be them same sex people, be them people who are not Jewish, etc. This is all over the place. And if it will all succeed, it will take years to undo because it's not an issue to come back to power and unlegislate it. Think that it will take, for the sake of it, five, six, seven years. There will be enough people who will be born into this reality and say, what's the problem? We are used to it. We never knew it's something different. And that's the problem of getting used to this kind of abusers. So the only thing we can do right now that we are not a government, but yet we struggle for something is to make sure that people do not forget how healthy, normal, liberal democracy functions. So the whole struggle, the whole process, the whole deliberation from our point of view with less power than the government is to be constant pain in the ass reminders. And and what about I mean in, in in addition to kind of being you know a, a pain in the ass which which we definitely should be but you know a, a a bunch of the questions that people have here is how do we get more people into our ranks including Israelis so so someone just asked right now how do we reach the religious community and I think it's um, you know an interesting question when we're talking about having a 
um, you know, secular society, meaning, of course, there are religious, could potentially be, will be religious people within it. How do we reach a community who right now potentially has more um, privileges in the current moment? But of course, over time, um, you know, anyone who is not going to fit into a very rigid uh, definition will probably lose those privileges as well. How do we reach those people, in your opinion? I don't have a good answer for it, but because the question of how do we is with us since the first day of democracy. How do we get more people? The entire elections in America is about 2%. 49 are Republicans, 49% are Democrats, and the 2%, how do we mobilize them? That's the question of the mother of all questions. It's very, very difficult. I do not believe in artificial attractions. I believe in substance, in the sense that if the equality and the constitutional offers and the operating system we're going to offer will be authentically so, a solution for all will offer the collective good that everybody by the end of the process will feel, wow, it's really about me. It's not just about being sensitive to the Arabs and insensitive to the Ethiopians or insensitive to the observant or insensitive to the ultra-Orthodox, et cetera. No, 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 no. Equality for all is good for me, the Orthodox woman. It's good for me. The deprived Palestinian is fantastic for me. The overprofiled by the police Ethiopian. If the offer is authentic and is not an invitation of, hey, you Arab, hey, you religious, hey, you observant, hey, you Ethiopian, come and help us to save the liberal Zionist comfort zone in Tel Aviv. But it's a real invitation for a new Israeli discourse by the end of the process, when they will realize how futile it is there, they will eventually end up here. But if our entire struggle will be about the comfort zone and about Tel Aviv only, and about minor things that nobody really understands, we never, we're never going to be attractive. And by the way, when you look at the process of you ask yourself, how do we as a demo, Democrats in America, how do we attract for the sake of it, conservative, Catholic Latinos into the democratic process. It's the same question. So many of them, yes, immigrants, yes, believe in tolerant society, but on the other hand, the family values are very conservative. So how do we talk to them from a very progressive democratic point of view? It's the same conversation. Can identity politics, which fragments every political liberal camp in the world get together and redefine the collective good rather than the sub-identity good. And that's a challenge, not just for us, for the European liberals, for the American liberals, for the Latin American liberals, and for whomever is there. And and what within that, and this is now a, a personal question, um, no one asked this in the chat, um, but, but what within that then would you challenge our own camp? Um, you're saying, right, how do we get out of the comfort zone um, of those who are currently in it? But I think also those within our camp are living in quite, not everyone, of course, um, not necessarily all minorities, um, not necessarily LGBT people, not necessarily all women, but in, in a general sense, we're also living in quite an, um, uh, you know, real and perceived comfort zone of our own. Where are you challenging our own kind of group think to leave that? As we, go, you know, as, as we think about to, fighting the radical right. I will go back to your feeling that there is no rage in the streets. Okay, your generation, and maybe it already began with my generation, is a generation that actually many of us never seriously experienced the miseries of the previous generations. No Holocaust. I mean, I saw a couple of wars, okay? My children did not. 
yes, military operations, but not a real comprehensive war like 67, like 73, like even 82. No hunger, no real deprivation. 98% of the Jews are living in the democratic hemisphere. So in a way, we are in a good place. And when you are in a good place, for many of us, the struggle is to struggle to improve the good place. For many people at the Israeli right, I do not want to talk now about the American right, because as much as there are so many similarities, um, the Israeli one is has its own characteristics. Many of them feel under two very serious threats. One is the conservative values, be it religious conservative, be it national conservative, be it economic conservative, are threatened by the liberal world order. The more we promote the LGTB values, the equality for, the more we promote feminism, the family structure collapses there. So they are struggling that in a war in a very dialectic way and i know it sounds crazy they fight back because we won so well now they push back and the second threat for them is they believe like so many huntington republican conservative george w bush and on people that the, it's the children of light versus the children of darkness. It's all of us good people versus all of the Muslims and others, liberals, bad people. So they are not only under threats of the liberal order bringing down their conservative structure, but it's also the external threat of the non-conservatives, be them liberal or be the Muslims. So they are in a war. So it's about a lot to do with emotions, a lot to do with persuasion. So the two ways to go about it are first to tell them, guys, part of your war and part of many of your, of your uh, uh, enemies are imagined one. They're not real. Let's analyze them one by one. I'll give you an example. When I was a little boy, we were educated or indoctrinated then in 48, seven Arab states or seven Arab nations or seven Arab armies, armies fought against us the not yet born state of Israel. Let's say 19 years later in 67, it was only three out of the seven, Jordan, Egypt, and Syria. Six years later in 73, it was only two out of the three, Syria and Egypt. And ever since with Egypt, we have strategic peace as difficult and high maintenance peace as it is but we have peace with them syria is not what it used to be and the palestinian problem was born in the middle of the process so i say to myself i say to my uh, right wing uh, uh, haunted by enemy around every corner say to them listen 75 years from seven to half a problem, the Palestinian problem, it's not bad as a development. We're not in 1938, as Netanyahu wants us to believe every day. And we are not in 48, as so many of you believe. We're in 2023, and the reality for us Jews and for us, even some Palestinians, is a better reality. Recognize it. So part of it is to undo or to diffuse some of the fears over there. And some of it, and it's a longer conversation than this one and now, is how do we develop an attitude at the progressive liberal camp, which is tolerant or even in dialogue with some elements of the conservative grouping. If we feel it is automatically all of us versus all of them about everything, so there is no conversation. It's almost impossible to persuade. But if we have enough middle grounds, whatever they are about, even global warming, even some family values, even some even respect to tradition and rites and rituals, not necessarily do them myself, but respecting 
and giving room and enabling. So if you put down the wall of animosity outside or the emo or the sentiment towards it, and you built up confidence in the conversation, it's a beginning of a movement. And the beginning of a movement is certainly what we need. And we're out of time. Thank you so much, Avrum, for all of your insights. I'm so proud of you all to, to be here. It's fantastic. It gives a lot of power, a lot of courage. Thanks, guys and girls. It absolutely does. Um, and Lindsay, I'm handing it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becca. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, and thank you to our speakers. Avram, your analysis on the situation was enlightening as always. Um, this talk today was the first in the American Friends of Combatants for Peace webinar series, Resisting the Radical Right. Um, next week, we'll, we'll have a talk with Palestinian entrepreneur and, lead, and leader Sam Bahor. He'll be speaking about Palestinian civil society. If you'd like to see our full list of upcoming talks, you can do so online on the Combatants for Peace events page, American Friends of Combatants for Peace page. Um, the link should be in the chat box if you wanna check that out. Um, today's talk was organized by American Friends of Combatants for Peace. Combatants for Peace is a grassroots movement of Palestinians and Israelis who are working together to end the occupation and bring peace, equality, and freedom to the region. Um, we're working together, organizing nonviolent civil resistance on the ground and also hosting series of education and leadership empowerment programs. Um, our movement is entirely funded by donations. And if you liked what you've heard today and would like to support our movement, we would be incredibly grateful. Um, the donate link should be in the chat box. We're all, also thank you again to Becca and Breaking the Silence for partnering with us and moderating this incredible talk. If you'd like to support their incredible work, um, their donate link will also be in the chat box. So thank you again to both of our wonderful speakers and for all of you um, who joined us today. We're so grateful for you all and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you very, very much all. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks.